And speaking of our planners, let's say hello to them. I think we starting with Chris. Uh, Chris is on the phone, and we're happy to have him on today. Hi, my name is Chris Boutique. I work for Portal Solutions, um, <clears throat> of course, doing SharePoint solutions, and I serve as a BA analyst as well as UX lead for the company. Nice. Thanks so much, Chris, and thanks for joining us today. Next up, we have John, who's on the phone as well. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, John White. I'm up here in the Great White North, uh, SharePoint MVP. Work with a company called uh, Unlimited Viz, and we focus on uh, forms, workflow, and business intelligence solutions for SharePoint. Uh, functionally, I guess I'd describe myself primarily as a BI architect or SharePoint architect. Cool. Thanks for joining us today. We miss you. <laughs> yes. And next up, we have uh, Natalia, who's definitely here and ready to say hello to the group. Hey, uh, my name is Natalia Vaskoselka. I'm Microsoft SharePoint MVP and also SharePoint and SAS uh, search engineer at COVID. Thanks, Natalia. And next up, we have Paul, who's our um, going to be our speaker for this month at the on um, the 29th, and he's going to say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Olenek. I'm a SharePoint architect and enterprise search engineer for Arcovis in New York City. Yes, and I just realized that I wrote that you have a new blog post, um, but that's supposed to be blog posts. <laughs> Sorry, no. Blog post, um, the problem of contextual search scope. So you can check out his, um, his blog at olenicsharepoint.wordpress.com, and it's pretty insightful if you're interested in learning a little bit more about search and search scopes. So without further ado, we just want to thank our COVID for organizing SharePoint Shop Talk at Microsoft Go to the site partners specializing in SharePoint and, and enterprise search. Um, you can always um, email our COVID at info at .com. And our COVID also offers a first search offering, which is for those of you who are still on 2007, uh, you can upgrade your search with 2007. So you can learn more about first search by contacting our COVID. And last but certainly not least, before we get into our first question, we wanted to just let you know, members, that we offer a ProSite subscription for one month free, um, provided by ProSite, of course, to any um, volunteer and sharing what you're doing with SharePoint. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. We actually have Daniel Westendale, who's going to be speaking shortly um, in the next coming week. So we're looking forward to hearing a lot from our members ongoingly. So without further ado, I'm going to unmute Nicole because Nicole sent uh, some questions in last week, but we couldn't get to it. Um, so we're going to start with her question, which was um, actually I'll let her answer it. She's on the she's on the phone. Um, Nicole, are you there? I am. Can y'all hear me? Okay. <laughs> hey, how are you? Doing good. Um, so I'm a I'm a sort of a SharePoint admin, but I'm also a pseudo server admin. So I need to learn SharePoint overall. And we purchased Idera's PowerShell Plus, and I haven't really learned it yet, but what I need to know is should I learn PowerShell itself first, or should I learn it through learning PowerShell Plus? <laughs> it's kind of like I like to learn HTML and Notepad before I learn front page, but you know, I don't know with PowerShell. <laughs> it, I, 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 I'll, it's John here, um, and I don't really know it well myself. so. Um, it, it would kind of come down to what do you want to use it for would be my first question. Okay. Um, probably primarily is going to be SharePoint admin and then secondary would be just doing some admin on the servers as far as finding, I don't know, files, whether patches have been applied, just general okay. stuff like that. So it, I, I, you kind of have my requirement for it, which is I learn it as I need it, um, and, and and that's pretty much through stealing other people's examples. There's um, there's a book, and I can't. It's another MVP, and I should know his name, and I, it's not coming to me. Does any if anybody else? Let's knows see. Okay. I've got but, um, um, I've got Nicholas Good's book, PowerShell for SharePoint 2010 admins. He he has a. Um, he has a uh, a blog, and he was from Gary LaPointe, probably. Gary LaPointe. Gary LaPointe. Gary LaPointe. Yep. Yep. He's uh, he's got a blog. He he was 
was kind of like the STS ADM guru, and now he's the the PowerShell guru. Okay. Um, he's got a bunch of stuff on PowerShell. Pa Todd Clint has an awful lot of good uh, examples on PowerShell on on his site. Um, and then uh, a fellow named Brian Lollinset has built the SP Auto Installer, and it's completely baked on PowerShell. Um, and I use it, you know, from an administrative standpoint to get farms set up. But an awful lot of people have torn it apart just to see how it works from a PowerShell standpoint. So you might want to go that route. Okay. Can you spell his last name? Uh, Brian Lollinset. Yeah. It, it, it's. Uh, I don't know. You'll find by looking uh, looking for him. L a l a, n c e t t e. Okay. And uh, but it's the the project is SP Auto Installer. Okay. It's on, it's on CodePlex. CodePlex. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. No problem. Apparently somebody wants me bad. All right. Well, I think I've got to get me started if nobody else. Other. And suggestions. just just to, just to throw one more thing in there as, as well. Um, from as uh, there's a tool out there. I think it's called Power GUI, which is kind of nice. Gives you some type ahead capability, some like IntelliSense sort of stuff with uh, with PowerShell. Okay. I've used it a little bit, but I, I just just coming at it, and I'm, I I consider myself a PowerShell novice. So. Gotcha. I also um, got a, and I'm going to mute John just in case he wants to add. Um, but I also got a comment comment from him that I shared with the group. Can you all see his comment that he made? Which is um, I would recommend focusing on learning. Now, I don't know this acronym. Um, PowerShell Plus. Like, oh, okay, PowerShell Plus before getting into PowerShell, PowerShell. Well, he says P-O-S-H. Oh, just right from PowerShell, PowerShell before getting into yeah. PowerShell Plus and PowerShell. Plus is very good and had a very handful of tips, but you're going to be running into PowerShell or service where PowerShell Plus may not be available. And, and remoting may not be possible. That's a good thought. And, and then there's also, I think, on the idea website, I, I tend to get these emails and I can sign you up, Nicole, if you, if you haven't. But I get an update from idea about PowerShell every single day. Oh, wow. And a lot of times I actually put it up on um, the Facebook um, site for um, SharePoint Shop Talk. But every day they send it to me as a new PowerShell, um, you know, tip. And uh, I, I think I got it because I was I went to the SharePoint Reviews um, site, I believe, and then all of a sudden I started getting these, these updates. But they're very uh, useful. So I, I'll, I'll show you where that is as well. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. So sorry, John didn't have a, doesn't have a microphone, but um, so uh, you can hear from him. But, th but thanks for your input, John. I appreciate that. So uh, our next question... Um, uh, Daniel is is not on today, but I figured this is a very uh, standard and easy question that the group can answer without him being here. And he sent this question in last week. So I wanted to get it answered for him. And and our group actually talked about this once before, which is um, upgrading, you know, the CUs. So uh, I'm just going to read his question for those of you who may be just on the phone or can't, or can't see it. But he says, I'm at a risk in an amenable environment with my current client, and the February 2012 CU has just been released this week. It's a bit premature to consider installing this on a live farm rather than previously stable October CU. I note that June and December CU had issues. Should I stick with the October and wait for SP2? I think actually the question like that in one or another form came up before of uh, quite a few times. And I usually share my experience with that. I'm usually waiting for the next CU to be released because usually the next CU actually fixes but what the current CU, you know, any issues that the current CU introduces into the environment. So I'm, I don't know, it might be not the best practice, but in my personal experience, it actually works pretty well. So I would probably at this point stick with the CU that um, that is prior to the February. Which, so, but it like, would be October, right? Uh, I think it's December. There's a December one too. Yeah, December one. Oh, that's what I'm using these days. Right. I it fixes, it fixes, fixes the, the user the profile bug. The, next one is Sorry. Did the December one have issues? Did you guys see issues in December one that Daniel's talking about? They, they all have issues. Okay. 
It's a question of which issues. <laughs> that's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, and the, the the other thing I'd throw in is is test it, right? If, if, if the issues it may have may have no effect at all on your environment, but it may affect your environment. So, make sure you've got a test farm set up to try any of this stuff out. You know, look before you leap, type of thing. What's the who's, I don't I don't know whose quote it was, but I'm going to steal it. Um, it. It's not a question whether or not you have a test environment. The question is whether or not you have a production environment. <laughs> You know, yeah, but, guys, yeah, one yeah. thing that I, I would point out, too, is that um, uh, I see some organizations that do have a test environment or a, and a dev environment, and they may even apply the, the patches on there. But what they don't have is a really solid testing script, so meaning yep. what are all the things that you need to hit. And, and, and so when I, I, I used to own a SharePoint environment at a large law firm, and, and one of the first things I did when I got there was like, Okay, what's all our mission critical applications? What's all our customized um, solutions? And what are the things we need to test every time we push out an update? And I would just go through each of those, and I'd do it in every browser, and I'd do it, you know what I mean? But if you don't have that, and, and it's not very well documented and sort of uh, tried and true, then you just, people, I, you know, they're kind of poking around and seeing if something big breaks, which, which isn't really sufficient. That's true. Another thing that I'll just add to what Paul mentioned, and it has nothing to do with the you know test script, but uh, sometimes uh, the test environment is nowhere even near to production environment. Meaning, I don't mean the failover and the infrastructure. No, no, I mean in terms of the solutions applied, and you know it's it's more like a dev kind of broken dev environment, and things that might work there might not work in production. So also make sure that you test it on the environment that is as close as production as possible. So when, when he says risk amenable, that means that they're OK with risk, right? Well, English is not my first language. I would definitely rely on you guys. Do you think he meant risk, of, <laughs> risk averse? I, I, I read it as OK with risk. So yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fire away. <laughs> Knock <your stuff. laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I wish he was on the phone, but I, I wonder. I mean, I guess maybe he has. Uh, no, I, are there any environments that exist that are risk amenable? I mean, other sure. than a test environment. Sure. 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 Some environments <laughs> don't even have a backup. That's right. That's right. Well, I think that, yeah, the one thing that, that uh, I'm getting feedback from there. The one thing that I'm, uh, I found very alarming was when he said that he wanted to just install on a live farm. So, I, you know, that's one of the things that you guys are just talking about. He probably should install it on his uh, test environment first, and then uh, if it if all goes well, then move it to um, his live environment. I guess the problem is that um, in some small implementations of SharePoint, and even not that small, but kind of organically grown without pre-planning, what I sometimes see is that the production farm is the only farm. And that is scary. It's also all too common. <laughs> All right, well, I, I think that that was very helpful to, um, to Daniel, as well as anyone who's, who's thinking about um, installing February CU. I guess you should just wait a little bit and see what people are saying, are testing on a test environment, and are, are wait for the next update. So uh, thanks a lot for your advice, guys. So this next question is going to be a little bit difficult. This is what I'm hearing from our panelists, at least. And uh, our attendee, um, John, he's here. So I'm going to unmute you, John. I don't know if you can unmute yourself, so I'm going to do it. Hello, John, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Hi. So I, I put this all of your whole question that you sent me on to the screen, though I think it might be best just for them to hear it from you. And um, so why don't you go ahead and tell us your question? Okay, well, um, it's related to building a custom solution in SharePoint. 
And one of the requirements we have is when we're um, using lookup fields that they should be filtered based on uh, criteria that's on the source list that's providing the lookup. Does that make sense to you guys? Yep. And <clears throat> I, this capability isn't available as I understand out of the box in SharePoint? Nope. So I went looking for a way to provision that capability and the best I came up with was a, um, a uh, custom field that uh, I found on CodePlex. It's called uh, filtered lookup. And there was a 2007 and a, and a 2010 uh, version of it uh, available. So that's where I was starting from. And um, when I was using the look, the custom, this custom lookup field, um, when I was when I deployed the uh, the solution package into my uh, into my server, when I was using the GUI, I was able to deploy, uh, create uh, site columns and and uh, and add uh, columns to lists, and it all worked fine. But I ran into a problem when I was trying to deploy it um, as part of my solution package, where I was trying to create a site column and then um, list columns. So the problem I ran into was that um, the uh, custom field, when it's uh, being provisioned into a site column, seems to mangle the ID of the lookup list that you're pointing to as part of your lookup. So I, I'm a little bit stuck. I had a look at the source code for the uh, field, the custom field, uh, trying to figure out what it was doing, and it it didn't seem to be actually doing anything with the um, properties that are picked out of the camel definition of my site column in my own in my own uh, solution package the custom field just basically passes that through it, it, it does a in the constructor it does a, a base call into the um, parent uh, out of the box uh, lookup uh, field type is everyone following me up to there I'm good okay so um, what I found was that in code, I could if I if rather than provisioning it as a in a using camel in a, in my feature, if in, in, if instead I actually wrote code to provision this uh, site column, then I could um, before the field actually gets created or saved, if I rewrite the value of the lookup uh, uh, list ID, then that fixes the problem. <clears throat> the, the first problem that I ran into. And what I had to do was that the, the ID of the lookup list, when it's first uh, created, um, has curly brace parentheses, and the GUID is in all uppercase. But uh, when SharePoint actually uh, saves this custom field uh, that I'm creating in my feature, it wants it to not have curly braces and in, be in lowercase. This is the GUID. So if I rewrite the GUID, as I'm creating it in code, then um, the SharePoint is able to provision the field correctly. But obviously, when it's coming from a camel in, in a uh, in an elements uh, definition inside my uh, my feature, then I can't uh, do that rewriting at that point. So you can see there's a little bit of funky behavior there with this custom lookup field that's uh, coming out of the uh, the project from Codeplex. And I'm just trying to look for some pointers that would point me in the right direction to figure out where, where in the blazes this uh, behavior of having a GUID that needs mangling to make it work properly. I, I um, it's John here. I've, I've got an alternate approach possibly for you that you might want to consider. Yeah. Um, I, I actually wrote one of these myself for for 2007 and. Um, just because we're talking about a cascaded lookup, right? You pick one value and one drop down, and it affects the choices for the second. No, actually, it's not a cascaded lookup. It's oh. a lookup where, in the source list, I have one of the um, fields in the source lookup. For example, is enabled. So if the okay. um, if the user yeah. in the source field has said, okay, these three or four uh, items in the in the lookup list are disabled, and therefore they shouldn't show up when I use this as a drop down on another list. Okay. Uh, fair enough. It, it's actually an easier case than a cascaded lookup. Okay. Um, but you can solve them both, and I don't know if it's an option for you, but with InfoPath. Um, if you use InfoPath to edit your list, what you can do is very, very quickly get in there, and, and I, I actually know 
a, a blog post that's going to be on this very, very shortly. I would imagine Laura has one. It's too bad she's not on the call. Um, but you, you can basically set up a secondary data source in InfoPath and just point it at the, at the source list. Right. And then with your combo box, you can simply filter that on whatever value you want to that's available in the, short, uh, in the source list. Same technique for cascaded, only that it's dynamic and you just look at the value of your first field for your filter value. But this would be even a static value. It's even easier. So I don't know if that's an option for you, but that's uh, that's the that's the approach I would take. Right. I, I did look at some other ways of, of solving the problem. Like I looked at having a um, a hidden list that was kept in sync with the the real lookup list, but didn't contain any of the disabled values. So whenever you modified the the, the main lookup list, it would using event receivers keep the uh, hidden list up to date, and then my, my actual site column that is uh, a lookup would point to the hidden list and not the actual real list. That was another option I looked at, but my initial thinking was that that was a lot more infrastructure and code and so on to have floating around, and this, this uh, custom field type from CodePlex looked really slick and worked fine on the GUI side. But I'll think about the InfoPath stuff. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, it's the only proviso on that is it's it, there might be some licensing issues in your in your environment, so I don't know if that'll work for you. But yeah, um, but it's a uh, it's a great solution. I I, uh, I threw out my cascaded lookup solution from 2007 because you can do that with InfoPath and Plenty Press. Thanks very much. No problem, guys. This is Paul. Just one one more thing to throw out, and and I I can't remember all the details right off my head, but. You're able now to use, um, what do they call them? I think they're just called additional fields in, in a lookup, right? So I do a lookup to a list, and I display one column, but I can also get columns from another, uh, uh, values from another column, right? And they're not called yes. for check. No. Go ahead. Secondary columns. Secondary columns. Couldn't you just create a list view? where you filter on that secondary column? <clears throat> um, my understanding is when you're creating a, just a plain, if you're just creating a plain Jane lookup column, that it's targeting strictly the entire contents of the list, and you can't point it at a list view. But maybe I'm wrong on that? I can't remember the details around it. That's where I'm, I'm fuzzy. Like if you just go into... Um, create new column and you pick lookup as the type you're going to create, then you're given a choice of lists that are local to your site to, to choose among to be the, the source of your lookup. And you can't pick a view on that list, you just pick the list itself. That sounds right. I wonder if maybe you could use a data view or something to um I just kind of think of a, a less codey solution. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Any uh, creative uh, ideas are welcome here. Okay, I I think that um, with that question, there's still some um, answers that could be addressed a little bit later as well. I don't know. Do you have InfoPath? Um, Th this particular solution um, doesn't involve any InfoPath, so it would, it would mean uh, opening up the solution architecture and, and to bring that technology in. Uh, so it's it's something that I could uh, discuss with the client. Uh, right right now, the approach we've taken is to um, carry forward with some hacks that we found seem to do an, uh, enough to work around the problem. Uh -huh. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, rewriting. <clears throat> what happens is I uh, I create um, an ordinary lookup in code. And then I patch the uh, schema XML to change the type, and then I rewrite the ID, the lookup uh, list ID field, and then I do an update on that uh, new field. And once it's committed with the update, having uh, basically uh, re uh, rewritten the lookup list ID to remove the parens, lowercase the GUID, and change the schema XML uh, type to be this uh, custom lookup type off of the CodeBlex project, then it saves and it works okay. But that's kind of nasty having that code in there and is a bit of a, a maintenance issue uh, for whoever takes it over to understand why it's doing that. And 
And there's some other secondary complications that, once again, we've had to work around with code. And the nice thing would be just if the darn thing worked in the first place. This is the uh, custom lookup type that uh, once you install the, the, uh, the, the package into your farm, then you've got, uh, in, when you go to create a site column, you've got that available as a, as a custom field type, and it all works from the GUI. But you can't, can't provision it from our own uh, feature package. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for your question, and um, John and and uh, Paul. Paul, who has actually left the call, um, he had to go to a client meeting. Um, thank you guys for for your attempt. And as well, uh, you know, I I believe that what we do is we um we we put these recordings up there. So so if I get any feedback from anyone who else has any ideas, I will definitely get in contact with you, John, as well. Well, thanks very, thanks very much for your time, guys. I appreciate uh, you entertaining my question. Well, stay there because I think you sent in two questions. I don't know whether you wanted to uh, talk about the other one. Um, sure, if, if people have the patience uh, to entertain another kind of programming development type question in the SharePoint context. I'll, I'll, we're here to answer questions, so um, go ahead. Okay. Let me just bring up my question because I wanted to make sure I, I had it clear in my mind um, what the question was. So <clears throat> it's kind of on the same project, but it's not exactly the same problem. What I'm doing is uh, in code, I'm provisioning a new column. <clears throat> and we have uh, lists with um, content types enabled. So what I'm doing is I'm adding a site column, <clears throat> and then I'm adding the reference of the site column to the content type. And that's all good. But what happens next is um, because there's a content type on my list, when I um, do the update on the content type uh, in code, there's an option that to provide a, an extra parameter to say push this change down to any uh, child content types and, and their lists. And if I choose that option, then fields get created in the, the list and on the, the list content types kind of automagically by SharePoint for me. And when those fields get created that way, they're not visible to me when I'm inside my code with my uh, references to my, my SP web object and my list collection and my fields collections of my lists. These fields that get automatically provisioned as a result of being pushed down from the site content type, they're not immediately visible to me when I iterate over the collection of the fields of that list, for example they're only become visible once I uh, release or close my SP web object and reopen it. So I'm just wondering, is that normal expected behavior? Because it means that I can't grab a hold of those automatically provisioned fields inside the list that were inherited through the content type and start doing things with them right away in my, my block of code. I would have to jump out and reopen the SP web. Anybody um, have any ideas on this one? Not here. I'm I'm not a developer, but it kind of makes sense because probably what so when you open up your um your SP web, it's kind of like a snapshot of what you you have at that point, and closing and reopening it. <clears throat> might be what what's updating it. It's just logical and kind of makes sense. I don't remember. I've done some coding, but it was so long ago. Yeah, it's a very uh, code intensive question that's maybe uh, something that a uh, more of a programming background is required to, to really get one's teeth into. The, the, the reason why it's a problem for me is because I want to put my list creation code inside of a feature that I'm going to be deploying. So I don't actually create my own reference to the SP web. I inherit that from inside the feature activation event. Uh, I, I receive a, an event uh, parameter that contains a reference to the SP web that the feature is being enabled on. So I can't actually release it and, re and reopen it. <coughs> I think you've uh, stumped the panel on this one, but what I'm going to do is add this, add both your questions actually onto our uh, LinkedIn site, which is where I, I kind of like this transition. What we'll do is have the questions and have them live here, and then 
um, kind of bring in any questions that might have stumped the panel or stumped our members and, and bring them on to LinkedIn and see if there's um, any um, advice from those who didn't make the, the talk. So um, sorry about that, but um, I really appreciate your time as well as your questions, John. No problems. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, listening to me and, and hearing out my, my questions. Thanks very much for your time. All right. Thanks. So I actually received a question from Julie, and this I received, um, she, she's on the opposite side of the world. So when we're up and having these chat talks, she's in the bed. And, but she still wants this question answered, and um, I was wondering if, if, if we could kind of give her some advice. And she reads, um, I have to develop a document record management system using SharePoint 2010. I've been but I'm still a bit confused with how I should start. What are the major things I should consider when starting this project? Will you be able to provide yeah, would you will you be able to provide me with case studies? <laughs> it would be good if you can answer my question in this week's shop talk. Um, I'm giving anyone a floor here if you can kind of just give her a starting point or maybe even some references of that uh, where she can kind of make sense of it all. Well, we've got a, a, a bit of uh, experience in the uh, in the records management, especially in the records management side of it, a fair bit, quite a bit in the in the document management. Um, major things I should consider with starting the project is get the requirements. Um, it's really a, it's a non-technical question in my books. Um, make sure that people understand what they they need to be working or what they want to be working with, what what they're doing. Um, Get some solid metadata definitions. Get solid um, security requirements. That, that, that's, a, that's a very big part of it. Oftentimes, security requirements uh, will, will even will, will drive the design of the site. But um, I, you know, with, with with the capabilities in, in SharePoint 2010, it does it does an awful lot. It's going to be capable of doing an awful lot of, of, of what they need. Our challenge in, in the market has always been getting people to articulate what they need. So gathering requirements is, is to my to my mind paramount. I don't I don't know if anybody else has got any comments. So when she's getting the requirements, who um, I guess it's just kind of like I guess uh, with governance in terms of asking you know the the, the end user the uh, the um, the business case, the, the, the IT side. I mean, is, where is she getting all these requirements from? It's 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 a, it's a, that's a good question. And, and again, far far too often these things are top down designed or they're IT designed, which is you know we got this cool solution. Here's what you need, and that's not what the users need at all. So, um, you know, some kind of a focus group that involves the business owners, but as well as as the business users. That they're the always the most underlooked, you know, bunch a cross-section of the people who are going to interact with, feed, and benefit from the system is, is what I recommend. 